Today I'm going to talk to you about some exciting topics, the topics that I'm passionate about. Uh, if you want to build a successful business, uh, what areas that you need to focus on? I also want to talk to you about, to analyze all the different business failures out there, why different companies failed. And we want to learn lessons from those failures so you can apply those lessons uh, to build a, a successful uh, organization. Now, I was uh, reading some statistics uh, before this uh, presentation. Uh, and one of the statistics I, I found out uh, from US Census Bureau that 75% of new businesses fails in first two to five years. 75% of them. And uh, one of the venture capitalists I was uh, talking, uh, one of my close friend, uh, he invests in multiple internet dot com businesses in the past. Uh, past now he's investing in uh, technology businesses. And I asked him uh, that what is your success rate when you invest into those businesses? And he was so proud. He says that my success rate on those investments is almost 15 percent. And he invested over 100 different companies over the years, but only 15 of them, 15% of them succeeded, and he was really proud of that. And I just saw a research by Research Technology Management that 10% of the businesses that's funded by a VC firm or the private equity firm actually ended up succeeding, and most of them failed. Then, there's another statistics I found out about uh, if you go to Las Vegas and you want to play in slot machine, what is your probability of winning? And what I found out that there's a 32% chance that you can win. If you play blackjack in Las Vegas, I found out that there's 42% probability that you can win. But if you start a business, there's more than 75 to 80% chance that you're going to fail and you're going to fail in the first two years. But here's the good news. Uh, there's a guy named Brian Tracy, and uh, I'm a big fan of him. He wrote over 30, 40 books. Some are success books, some are business-related books. Uh, and, and a lot of his books, one of the statistics he mentions, uh, based on some sources, that 90% of the businesses, his statistics is saying, is that fails on first two to five years. But good news is that if somebody has prior business knowledge or somebody who failed in the business in the past and restart that same business all over again or something else, they have a probability of succeeding by 80%. So that's the good news. So I'm very fact that you're here and you want to learn about business success. Uh, one of the ways you can decrease your chance of failing is by analyzing other people's failures and then analyzing other companies that became successful, why they became successful in the first place. And that's what I'm going to cover with you. And um, I want to also tell you that I started the business for my first business, Netcom Learning, almost uh, 16 and a half, 17 years ago. I was involved in the dot-com business when I was uh, 22 years old. And a lot of my businesses failed in the past. And when I look into these statistics, if I saw those and read those statistics when I initially started the business, I would run. I would never start my business. I would be scared. I would be really, really scared uh, to start the business, uh, business. So I'm really sorry that I'm giving you those information because this information can actually have a negative impact uh, because now you'll be fearful of starting your own business. But that's not the purpose of the of this presentation. Purpose of the presentation is giving you guidance that what are the mistakes that you can avoid so that you can build your own business in the, in the long run. Over the years, last uh, 10 to uh, 12 years, uh, one of the questions I want to find out from, uh, from the top business people and top leaders is that why, why they personally became successful and why their business became successful. This is a question that I wanted to find. And every time I meet a top CEO, CLO, CIO, decision makers, I ask them the simple question, same simple question. How did you become successful? What made your company successful? And by doing that, what I'm finding out, that by doing 100 hours of interview, that all of them at the end is, end is speaking about exactly the same thing. They all are talking about 
here is the seven things that ma will make you successful. It's not just about seven things, it's more than seven things, but those seven things are constantly they are talking about. I also bra brag about over the years, I read over 1,400 business books. I'm not making it up, I really read it. And some of the books are books I actually dissected it. And the reason I did that, because I really want to understand what works, what doesn't work. And I'm still a student, I'm still continuously learning. So by reading those books, by talking to CEOs, CLOs, decision makers, leaders from different industry, by doing self-directed research, because sometimes I learn by doing research, I have drawn a conclusion that all successful people has seven things in common. All successful companies are applying seven principles. And some of the people that we interviewed, I have the list over here. As a matter of fact, we even interviewed former Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson a few months ago, and I asked him the same question. What made you successful? How did you make Goldman Sachs successful? How were you able to save the U.S. economy when the economy collapsed? I'm, I know some of the people probably don't like him, but he's, he was a great leader. I believe I did a lot of research on him. Uh, how he was able to get to the top. I asked him the same question. And by doing this, I found out they all have seven things in common. I'm repeating. So my question to you now is that do you want to find that out? Are you curious? Yes. Yes? yes? All right. If you're curious now, now I will get into it. Uh, so seven things that made them successful. <laughs> have you guys watched this movie, Godfather? Yes. If, how many of you saw this movie? I tell you, it's one of my favorite movies. I have probably seen this movie, all three of them, 25 to 30 times. I don't know what it says about me. I love this movie. When I was in school, I remember I used to go to Blockbuster to rent this movie. And then at what point I decided, you know, I go, I've been renting and paying Blockbuster. Maybe I should buy that movie. I ended up buying that movie. I used to live in Forest Hills. From Forest Hills, I moved into Long Island. And during the moving process, I lost my Godfather movies. So recently I was in Netflix and Netflix somehow figured out a way that I love Godfather. And they recommended me The Godfather and I ended up watching The Godfather movie all over again a couple of weeks ago. But I started to think about Blockbuster. Blockbuster went bankrupt. When did they go bankrupt? They went bankrupt in, I believe, 2009, they went bankrupt versus Netflix right now has market capitalization, I saw a couple of days ago, is $26 billion. So see what happens. I still love Godfather movie, but how I consumed it, it changed. And that's exactly what happened with Blockbuster. The reason Blockbuster went out of business is because Blockbuster saw those changes coming. Customer behavior was changing. They knew they need to change, but they didn't change fast enough. And because they didn't change fast enough, they didn't modify their business model. Since they didn't modify their business model, they went out of business. And now, Netflix has huge market power. But watch. Netflix can also go out of business. Amazon is going after that business. All the media company that made mistakes and weren't able to make those changes fast enough, now they're making those changes. So if Netflix don't continuously modify their business model, they're going to also go out of business. So if you want to make your business successful, you have to continuously modify your business model. I want to talk about one of our portfolio company, Netcom Learning. This is one of the facilities that we have. We have over 13,000 square feet here. And I want to tell you how Netcom Learning transformed over the last 16 years. Initially, when we started the company, we decided we are going to go after IT training because there was a huge boom about uh, uh, technology training. As time went in, we realized that when we going in and attacking top corporate clients, uh, we already serviced 90% of the Fortune 500 companies. They not only have need for technology training, they're also looking for uh, business training solution. So we thought that is going to be a right business model for us. The fact that we already understand how to do technology training, maybe we should go after technology and business training solutions. But we started to learn over a time, a time period, training and learning is two different things. There is a connection to it. 
through training, you build skills. Through learning, you transform a person, an individual or a, a, a organization. So when we define the organization as a learning organization, we see that it's no longer about training. We can provide other services to uh, corporations. But now we are seeing that learning industry is completely going through a transformation process. And if we don't become innovative, and if we don't reposition the company as an innovative learning organization, we are going to become obsolete. And I want to share some data with you. What we found out that three years ago, our live online training was only 1% to 2% of the overall revenue. Now, this year, approximately 45% of our revenue is live online training. But see what's happening. The trainers that are teaching the classes right now, the, our past trainer, they are no longer right for this organization unless they develop their skills. Because how you teach classes effectively on online version versus classroom training is different. But one thing I want to point out that, that our trainers also, we had to train them how to run a class effectively uh, in online format. So you see what happened in Netcom? We went from IT to IT and business training to IT and business learning to now building an innovative learning organization. And one of the reasons we are still in business, 80% of our competitors are gone. The reason we are still in business, I'm proud of the fact we are still in the business because we are constantly transforming the organization. And what we are learning, that if all of our portfolio company, if it want to succeed, we can no longer be in the education sector. We have to be in the media sector. Because eventually we believe that education and media sector is going to merge together. So number one lesson is that if you want to make a business successful, you have to constantly modify your business model. I want to share this code by Charles Darwin. It's one of my favorite code. It's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent that survive. It is the one that is the most adaptive to change. If a business don't continuously change, they're going to go out of business. So if you start a business, make sure that never fall in love with your idea. If you fall in love with your idea, very good chance that you are not going to be able to stay on the business. You might be able to make it successful for a short period of time, but eventually it's going to collapse. I mentioned earlier that I had the opportunity to talk to Hank Paulson. And during the interview, when I asked him what made you successful, what made Goldman Sachs successful, and he was immediately be able to answer this is the number one reason why Goldman Sachs became successful. This is the number one reason why I became successful. Can anybody guess here what he said? Is the people, is the strong leadership and management team. That made him successful. And I want to share data with you. Uh, there was a research done by a company called GAC Smart. Uh, and I found this research on this book called Who. And uh, this company, they interviewed over 400 CEOs, billionaires, entrepreneurs, a lot of successful people, and asked them this question that what makes a successful business? And what they found out through the survey, that 52% of the decision makers says what made their company successful is the management talent, leadership talent. Of course, strategy, execution, external factor is important. To me, external for factor is not important at all. Because that's a way, that's an excuse for us to say that that's the reason why business is not successful. It has a reason. You cannot really have strong execution unless you have the right management and leadership team. You can't really have a right strategy unless you have the right management team. So if you want to make a business successful, right now you might have a one-man operation, but ultimately you want to find out that how you can bring people in within the organization who is way better than you. Or how can you can bring somebody who can complement your skills because that's the only way you'll be able to make your business successful. There's no other way around. I'll be giving a similar presentation in Microsoft uh, Worldwide Partner Conference uh, next month. Uh, and because of that reason, I actually added this slide. What I found out in Microsoft, if you look at how Microsoft started, you guys already know the story of Microsoft. Bill Gates initially started the organization, and after that, Steve Ballmer came in. Now, Satya is the new CEO of Microsoft. But let's analyze Microsoft, what's happening in Microsoft. Even though a lot of people think it's Microsoft is not successful, but we need to realize Microsoft revenue is growing year after year after year. When Bill Gates uh, started Microsoft, it has zero revenue. He left the company with $32 billion revenue. This guy came in, 
took over a $32 billion revenue company and took it and made it $77, million, $77 billion company, for, so from $32 billion to $77 billion. Now a new guy is coming in, we'll see what he does. But when Bill Gates started the business, Microsoft was a software company. When Steve Ballmer left, Microsoft is a software, hardware, and a service company, but mostly a software and, and hardware company. And this guy is going to go after more about service businesses. So you see that Microsoft went through a transformation. If they didn't do that transformation, they would have gone out of business. As a matter of fact, what Microsoft is realizing right now that the very team that made the company successful, they're right for the organization when they founded the organization, when they were running the organization, but right now they're no longer right for the organization. You need to bring new blood in who can transform the organization. But key reason Microsoft is successful because of these guys, and they surround themselves with strong people. So Microsoft went through a business transformation. Now they're going through a management transformation. One of my favorite uh, uh, author, I love this guy, I took classes with him, Jim Collins, and if you guys like to read business books, read his book, uh, Good to Great is one of his best books. He also wrote about why the mighty fall. And one of the things Jim Collins said that the most important decision that business people make are not what decision, but who decisions. The reason Netcom is moderately successful is because we have good people in the organization. We can become a great organization if we can get great people within the organization. I was reading a book a uh, couple of weeks ago, a new book uh, written by Claudio. Uh, he's an Ivy League professor. He's uh, revered by a lot of CEOs out there. And the title of the book is not the how or the what, but the who that makes a company successful. Your idea is not that important. When you start a business and you go and pitch it to, if you're going to go and pitch it to venture capitalists, most of the people don't care about your idea. They care about you. It's not the idea. It's not the what business you want to open is important. It's not your strategy that's important. It's who is more important than anything else. So surround yourself with the right people. Mark Fessiano is a guy, uh, he invests on small companies. Uh, I believe he invested on 10 to 15 companies. He's a venture capitalist. Uh, he actually sold his business to Oracle for over $200 million. And uh, since he invests on small businesses, I ask him why most of the businesses fail. He gave me many reasons, but he told me that one of the key reasons most businesses fail is because they don't have access to capital or they run out of cash. They don't know how to do proper cash management. And I just saw statistics by U.S. Bank. It mentions that 82% of the businesses fail due to poor cash management. I have seen organizations, their revenue went up, their profit went up, but their cash flow went down, therefore they collapsed. So you can really have a healthy business where your profit margin is high, your revenue is going up, but you don't know how to manage cash. I also want to point out, analyze all of the great companies right now in the United States that's growing significantly, or a small startup became big. And if you do deep research, you're going to find out that everybody ha got funding from somebody. So if you want to really scale a business and if you want to grow, and if you want to do it by working hard and with your own money, there's a very good chance you won't be able to scale it. So you know that cash is the oxygen of the organization. We have to make sure that if you're running an organization, you have to manage your cash, but you need to consistently look for funding from, from outside. So I covered so far three things. Three, if you want to make business successful, what are the three things I covered so far? Number one, business model. Constantly change your business model. Number two, management and leadership team. Surround yourself with great people. Make sure you have a strong leadership team. What's the third? Money. Make sure you have access to capital. And if you're actually running a business that has revenue, you want to manage the cash uh, effectively. Now I want to talk about uh, that what does uh, Steve Jobs Bill Gates and uh, uh, Larry Page or Sergey Bin have in common? Can anybody guess? What do they have in common? They're founders. They're all founders. They're all passionate. Innovative. They're all innovative. White men. They're all white men. <laughs> Great point, actually. Great point. Okay, now let me ask you re uh, reshape the question. What does Apple, 
uh, iPhone, Windows, and Google have in common, the companies have in common. They're all technology company. What else? Revolutionary product. Revolutionary product. That's, the, that's the point I was looking at. If you go and look into in the history, all great innovator, all great business people, they were great marketer, and they know how to come up with great product. You can have the best possible product, but if you don't know how to market yourself, you're not going to be able to succeed in business. But you'll also find out that all of these guys, they not only market their company, they market themselves also. Because you cannot build a brand of an organization just building the brand of the company, company product. You have to also build the brand of the founder. Because if you don't build the brand of the founder, then you won't be able to raise capital. So they are all great marketer, and they all came up with innovative product. That's why I want to talk about marketing. Marketing is so important. If you want to make a business successful, you have to make sure that you build a strong marketing department. And if you are a single entrepreneur, you got to become a great marketer. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to stay in the business. And I want to talk about the definition of marketing. Uh, whenever you think about marketing, what goes through your mind? What is marketing? Advertising. Advertising. What else? Brand. Brand. Competitive advantage. Researching. Researching. What else? Communication. Communication. You all write. But I want to point out that m average people, when it comes to who doesn't know about marketing, they will usually say marketing is about communication, marketing is about brand, marketing is about catalog, design logo. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. That's how marketing has been defined by most people, because marketing has not been properly understood by most people. And, uh, and I was recently looking at the definition by American Marketing Association and look into their uh, definition. Marketing is the activity, set of institution, and process of creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging of offerings that have values for customer, clients, partners, society as large. Too complicated. <laughs> I don't understand it. It's too complicated. That's the broad definition. But if you really look at what true marketing is, I'll give you a marketing definition that I believe in. And by reading the thought leaders and by running a business and doing what works, what doesn't work. How I define marketing. Whether you agree or not, I want to define it. And eventually, you're going you're gonna to realize that's probably the right defi definition. My definition, generate profitable revenue by using resources to satisfy the need, wants, and decision of targeted customers need, wants, and decisions of targeted customers. I didn't say all customers. And I also didn't say generate revenue. I said generate profitable revenue. So most marketers, they are not able to tie their marketing activity back to profitable revenue. Marketing is sitting in the middle, connecting the business with customer. Therefore, marketing is the most important function. As a matter of fact, uh, one of my uh, book mentor, and uh, I don't know if you guys heard of Peter Drucker. He wrote, hun he's, he's probably the father of management. I dissected all of his book. I love this guy. And when I found out that he died, uh, the day I found that out, I was actually depressed for a week. I love this guy. Everybody in business community actually admired this guy, Peter Drucker. But Peter Drucker once said, and I'll paraphrase, he believes that business has only two functions. Since the purpose, core purpose of any business is to attract and retain cu a customer, business has two and two functions only. He says innovation and marketing. Innovation and marketing goes hand to hand. So earlier when I was talking about Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Sergey Vin, what do they have in common? We really talked about product and we also talked about marketing. Marketing and innovation goes hands on hand. So marketing is one of the most important things that knowledge that you need to develop in order to effectively build a business, run a business, or make a business successful. I'm going to share one of my favorite quotes, and I find it funny. I don't know if you guys are going to find it funny or not. David Peckward, the co-founder of HV, marketing is too important to be left to the marketing department. So what he's basically saying, if you really go and 
do research, what made HP, HP successful. Those guys were all great marketers. They knew how to market themselves. They also knew how to market their product, their company. Remember my definition of marketing, marketing is sitting in the middle, connecting the businesses with customer. So therefore you cannot outsource marketing to the marketing department. You need to be involved with uh, marketing. I want to share a story about a small business. A friend of mine, I know him for almost uh, 20, 24, 25 years. We went to school together. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, we came to this country together almost uh, 22 years ago from one of the poorest country, uh, Bangladesh. And, uh, and he, when he came in here, he went to good school, got his education, and he was also, he wanted to become a computer scientist, then he wanted to become a programmer. Uh, he wanted to go into the management and leadership. He has strong education background. And he ended up getting a job in Wall Street and making a lot of money there. He was telling me that in sev seven to eight years after working, he saved, I know it for a fact, I'm not telling his name, he, he saved over half a million dollars for a short period of time. And then he decided to start his business. He started a Microsoft consulting firm. Initially, it was a $100,000 revenue. He grew it to quarter million dollar. He made it a multi-million dollar business, and he wanted me to join his board. So I joined his board, and I didn't charge him anything because he was my friend, so I wanted to advise him. And during the process, what I found out, that initially his business was successful because he was doing less things. But as he started to grow, he started to increase his product offerings. And every quarterly basis, when I went to the meeting, every time I went there, I heard different things. So once I heard that he's positioning the company to become a software development company and build an outsourcing firm in India and do the development there and sell the service here. Three months later, I go back and he says, I want to set up a Microsoft SharePoint consulting service. Three months later, he's saying that I'm going to build a, a Microsoft Great Plains CRM, Exapta Consulting Company. So every three months, his business model is changing. So earlier I said that change your business model. Now I'm saying don't change your business model. It's a contradiction. So what problem he had? So guess what happened to him? He made a lot of money. He invested money on his company. Then his company was growing. He was making more money. He actually started his business in Wall Street. Do you think his business still exists? He went out of business. He tried to do too many things. He lost his focus. So Steve Jobs, when he came back to Apple again, he sat on the board. He brought all the management team. And he went over and says that, hey, how many different products that we have? How many different services that we are servicing? They're mainly a product company. And he find out that 80 to 100 different products they have. So he went to the board and he drove four boxes. He's like, we are going to cut everything and we are going to have four product only and we are going to go deep focus on them and we are going to make the best possible product. What he was really talking about is that less is more. Because if you have 80 to 100 product, now you have to distribute the resources among 80 to 100 different business sectors. And most businesses, when you go in and you look into your product, you're going to find out that 20% of your product is giving 80% of the revenue. 80 20 rule, you all know about that. Even when you hire employees, if you build a huge organization, you're going to hire employees, you're going to find out 20% of your employees producing 80% of the result. Nobody can beat that statistics. So he realized that 20% of the product is bringing actually 80% of the revenue. And you'll also find out, you'll ask the question, it's not about which 20% of the bring, uh, product is bringing the highest revenue. You want to ask the question, which 20% of the product bring the highest mar margin revenue for you? Apple has been known for generating highly profitable product. So he went back and cut all of the products made a lot of the management team angry and upset, and repositioned the entire organization for four products only. And that was the time when Apple started to turn around. So everybody now talk about Apple because they became successful, but they didn't realize Apple almost went bankrupt multiple times. They ran out of cash multiple times. But this was one of the reasons, not the only reason, it was one of the reason, uh, decision point that he made that made the company successful. I'll go back to 
uh, one of the concepts that uh, Jim Collins talks in the Good to Great book called Hedgehog Concept. What he talks about that if you really want to build a successful company, you need to ask three, three questions. What you are best at, what you are passionate about, and what drives your economic engine. What you're best at, what you're passionate about, and what drives your economic engine. So what he's basically saying, you need to figure out your core focus, your core competencies, and you need to stick to it. Most businesses fail not because of lack of opportunity. Most businesses fa fail because they don't have the ability to say no to opportunities. That's the lessons he's teaching, that how you can narrow your focus onto few things, but do it really well. Focus is one of the key to business success. It's a very easy thing to see. As a matter of fact, this is one of the things I struggle with. Sometimes I want to do too many things because I have too many dreams. And then I go back and remind myself that, hey, it's better for you not to do a lot of the dreams. You have to actually kill the dream. Not, it's not a good idea to execute on all dreams. You have to sit down and think about which dreams are going to be most profitable dreams for you and then go after those dreams. There is a quote by uh, a Chinese philosopher, uh, and I love this quote, person who chases two rabbits catches neither. Less is more, that's business success. Secret. I was in uh, Microsoft uh, two years ago, a roundtable conversation, 15 CEOs and the owners and the decision makers of Microsoft partners uh, came in and the moderator just asked one question during the entire time. What is the biggest business challenge that you have? Or what is the biggest challenge you're facing within that organization? And during the discussion, everybody said one thing. They said multiple things, but everybody said one thing that was common within their organi organization. And I'm not going to tell you what did they say, but what is the biggest business challenge? Can anybody guess here? So same thing happened. Ati Riazi, uh, she's the CIO of the United Nations. And I asked her, what is the biggest challenge you're facing within your own organization right now? The answer I got here, answer I got having the conversation with her, was exactly the same answer. They all said one thing, that they have a skill gap problem within their organization. So look how the skill gaps get created. We talked about earlier about business model innovation. Microsoft was a software company. They became a software and a hardware company. Now they are a software, hardware, and a service company. Microsoft has window product before. Now this product changed. Now Windows SharePoint Exchange. Now they're going after all of the product having cloud version. And recently I'm using Yammer. So when you do business model innovation, your job role also consistently changed within the organization. So all the, the, the very people that made the organization successful and the very people that had the right skills to do the job, they cannot do the job anymore. And that's why they all are having the problem, skill gap problem. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, one of the CIO survey uh, mentioned that 50% uh, that of the CIOs cannot find the right people with the right skills to do the job. According to the ASTD, that 70% of the business leaders are saying is that we have av jobs available, but we cannot get the right people with the right skills. So everybody's talking about skill gap problem. And then when you talk about the skill gap problem, the, everybody starts to blame US education system is bad. So one group will say education system is bad. Another group will say it's the problem with the corporations. Another group will say it's the individuals who is not taking personal responsibility. They all are right. Everybody is right. But if an organization wants to become successful, they need to build a learning organization. One of the best ways for you to solve the skill gap problem is to train your employees. Develop them. Coach them. Jack Walsh already solved the problem in GE. When Jack Walsh took over GE, GE was only $13 billion company. And when he retired, after 30 years, at one point, it was the world largest organization. World largest organization. I mean, I took some classes with actually Jack Walsh uh, face to face. One of the class where uh, a group of people went in and could have intimate uh, discussion with him. It's a, a couple of days of uh, event, and you had to pay $10,000 for 
uh, for it. And during that event, I asked Jack Welch, because I have a problem, I ask questions. I asked him, what made GE successful? And some of those answers, actually, he said before in his book, winning. Guess what he said? What made his company successful? Is he built a learning organization. He believed, one of the quotes he mentioned, an organization's ability to learn and translate that learning into action rapidly is the ultimate competitive advantage. So if you want to build a successful organization, you need to have focus. You need a strong management team. You need to manage your cash. You need to cons consistently transform your business model. But on the same time, you need to build a learning orga organization. You need to develop your people. And you need to develop yourself. Sometimes you are going to be the problem. So some, all of you, some of you are saying you want to build your own organization. You're going to find out at some point, two, three years later, you are the problem. So if you don't consistently develop your skills, if you don't change yourself, if you don't change your th thoughts, if you are not open to learning, you won't be able to build successful organization. So you want to become a lifelong learner, and you also want to build an organization where you want to promote, promote learning. How many of you heard about Zappos uh, in the past? Uh, you probably know the story. Uh, Tony Shea sold his company to Amazon for over $1.2 billion. And if you ask Tony Shea what company are you running, he will never say he's running a shoe company. He consistently talks about his company purpose, that he wants to deliver happiness. He doesn't talk about shoes. He talks about the culture, how you can build a strong culture. As a matter of fact, he's a marketing genius. He built the right product, the right process to sell the product. But what he's really passionate about, if you follow him, he's passionate about purpose. He knows what he wants to do. He's passionate about building a strong culture. That's what made Japos successful. So I, I believe with the conviction that if you start a business, don't start a business to make money or make profit. That cannot be the reason. You need to find a bigger purpose. Why do we exist in the first place? That's the question you have to ask. Why my business exists in the first place? Once you know what is your core purpose of the organization, you're going to find the true power. And you will be able to connect revenue and profit back with that purpose. There is a writer, Daniel Pink. I recommend you to read his book, Drive. And on the book, he talks about theory that what motivates people. And he talked about three things motivate people, autonomy, mastery, purpose. What he's saying is that if you want to motivate your employees, most employees want to do things their own way. You can give them guidance. You can set a structure. But you still have to give them the autonomy to do the things that way. That motivates them. Second things motivate people is the mastery. People want to develop, the, develop their skills. So see how it goes back to learning. If you can help to develop the skills of your employees, you'll see that they're going to be highly motivated. But most importantly, what's talking about that you need to find the bigger purpose why you're building that business. And if you can communicate that information back to your employees and back to your customer, you will be able to motivate themselves. As a matter of fact, you have to, it cannot be, uh, it cannot be fake. It's something you have to believe in. It needs to be in your DNA. You cannot copy somebody else's purpose. You cannot copy the purpose of Zappo CEO, what he believes in, or what Google founder believes in organizing world information. That's not your purpose. You have to find your true purpose and be able to build a business around that purpose. And when you can do that, the true success will happen. I want to share a quote with you. I love it. Professor Clayton, Harvard professor, he said that, decide what you stand for and then stand for it all the time. The purpose of Shardar TV is to promote learning. And we want to make sure that any service that we provide, any product we create, that it ties back to our purpose. Purpose of Netcom Learning is a little bit different. We want to promote the values of lifelong learning. Everything we do, it connects back to our purpose. Every time somebody is taking a class at Netcom Learning, we are funding education for a child in third world country. We're not doing it for marketing purpose. There's a marketing value to it. 
we're doing it because it's who we are. We want to promote the importance of learning. This is almost 16 and a half years I'm running Netcom Learning. And even today when I wake up, I couldn't wait to come back to work. I love what I do. As a matter of fact, based on the principle I told you before, one of the things Netcom need to do is that we need to replace the CEO. Because if the same CEO stays in the company for too long, that company won't move. And that's a, one of the positions that I'm trying to create, I'm working on, and I have some three candidates in place who is going to take over this company in the next level because the other portfolio company I will be running. But know your purpose. You really, really need to know that. So I want to summarize. If you want to make a business successful, you got to make sure you have a strong business model. Don't fall in love with your business model. Consistently change the business model based on what's happening in the marketplace, based on the changes uh, the customers is requesting. If you want to build a successful company, you have to make sure you have a strong leadership and management team. The most important decision a business person makes is the who decision, not what decision. If you want to make a business successful, you have to have access to capital. You have to manage your cash properly. And if you want to scale it fast, there is no other way but to access to VC funding or private equity funding or get big bank loans. You need access to the capital. Marketing is one of the most important functions of the organization. As Peter Ducker says that business has only two key functions, marketing and innovation. Marketing sits in the middle, connects the businesses with the customers. So marketing cannot be left to the marketing department. You need to become a strong marketer if you're a founder of an organization or if you're a C-level person in an organization. If you want to build a strong organization, you need to build a strong learning organization. And it starts with the management and the leadership team. If you got to become a passionate lifelong learner and you need to infuse that culture within the organization. And most importantly, you need to know what's your purpose. Why your business exists in the first place. The purpose of Netcom Learning is to promote the values of lifelong learning. Purpose of Sharda TV is to promote learning. The moment we think we know it all, we stop growing. Develop the passion for learning, be a lifelong learner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.